Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, or perhaps it's evening where you are. Uh, we're going to wait a couple minutes for folks to dial in um, on their old school telephones, I know, and then we'll start. Uh, thanks for your patience. Good morning again, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Honeycomb Learn number four, Bubble Up to Spot Outliers in Production. And as you may have noted, there are already three installments in the Honeycomb Learn series, uh, which are all available on demand via our website at honeycomb.io slash resources slash webinars. Um, before we dive into the presentation, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, uh, the first thing is, if you have a question at any time during this webinar, Please use the Adobe player. Uh, we're not going to stop during the presentation to answer questions, but we will address questions at the end. Um, and then the second thing is, please, at the end of this webinar, take a moment to rate our presentation and provide feedback using the Rate This tab below the player. So let's do some introductions. Danielle? Hi, I'm Danielle Fisher. I'm the principal design researcher here at Honeycomb. I've been here for about a year, and my work centers on thinking about data visualization and analytics. I'm really interested in how people deal with data and understand it, and I'm loving ways of applying visualization to the SRE experience. <laughs> Hi, and I'm Rachel Perkins, aka Pi. Uh, I'm in charge of words in the community and to some degree the documentation here at Honeycomb. I spent the previous nine years running docs and community at Splunk, starting back when it was about 60 people. And what drew me to Honeycomb was seeing the same potential for a huge step forward for folks who run code in production. So I'm excited to share some of that uh, with you today. Uh, Danielle, you want to run us through the outline for today? Sure. We're going to start off by talking a little bit about observability and understanding complex systems, which I'd argue is a fundamental way of thinking about visualization for data. We're going to, throughout this talk and indeed through everything that Honeycomb does, we're going to talk a lot about the ideas of high dimensional data and high cardinality data. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some examples of what those look like. This is going to lead us to an analysis method that we call the core analysis loop. Explore your data and get to know what's in it. And, that of, and that's going to lead us directly into a tool that we call Bubble Up, which I'll do as a live demo to introduce really new ways to dive into your data and explore it from different perspectives. Awesome. And before we get into the meat of our discussion today, remember, we will be gathering questions up in the questions tab and we'll review and respond to them at the end. So do ask away. And we're also going to be giving a demo of using Bubble Up and Honeycomb. So you will see Honeycomb in action today if you haven't before. Uh, but first, observability. I expect you're hearing the term a lot lately, but I'd like to make sure that we're all using the same definition. Um, uh, this definition is from Wikipedia. In control theory, observability is a measure of how well internal states of a system can be inferred from knowledge of its ex external outputs. Now, we've taken this term uh, to heart here at Honeycomb. 
because it really reflects what we're trying to offer. Where we want our users to be able to figure out what's going on inside their system without having to ship new code. And that last part is important. Um, our co-founder and CTO Charity Major is, expands on this uh, subject in this tweet. And if you don't follow Charity on Twitter, I recommend you do. She's pretty opinionated about a lot of things to do with shipping and running code and production, as well as the occasional whiskey discussion. And durability is that it's not just a thing you get to and stop. It's a journey. And as I've mentioned earlier, there are uh, some previous installments of this webcast series, and they represent different steps on the path to observability. Now, we've got them in an order here, but in terms of a progression, the only one you really have to do before the others is the first one, because you have to have instrumentation before you can really do the rest of these things. Um, and that first webinar provides a great base on which to build your observability practice. So I recommend you check it out and share it with you. But uh, today, we're going to focus on how to identify outliers and anomalies in your data using a feature we developed specifically for that. First, we're going to take a closer look at heat maps, what they're for, how to read them, and the importance of having access to rich event data and lots of context so you can pinpoint where in your code the problem could be. Uh, and then we'll finish the series out after this one uh, with the next episode where we'll cover how to collaborate using Honeycomb, how you can curate and share what you've learned, and as well as learn from other team members by building on their previous experiences, which is huge. So we'll be promoting that one in the coming week, weeks or so, so keep an eye out. Um, but let's dive into the meat of today's session, Danielle. I'll hand things over to you now to talk about high dimensionality and high cardinality in data and why nowadays those things are more important than ever. Absolutely. Thanks. You were just talking about the importance of instrumentation and the value of being able to dive into uh, really understanding the context of what happened with your system. And I think if Honeycomb has one underlying theme, it really is this drive towards, towards observability and trying to understand as much as we possibly can about what's going on in the system. And the best way to do that is to do a good job of instrumenting, which means that you can record it. Now, one of the challenges that we've seen in certainly some of our competitors' tools and sometimes in our own instrumentation is that you might not have captured enough data. So I'm starting off this conversation about high dimensionality to say we love dealing with many columns of data, as many as you can give us. So today we're going to be using a demo data set that has, well, as you can see here, Oh, about 20 columns of data, things like an availability zone, the, which is someone's Amazon zone, and the duration that queries took, and the number of endpoints, and that sort of thing. But in fact, and 20-something is a fairly impressive number. But in fact, like internally, when we're doing real analysis on like the Honeycomb production systems, well, this is a screenshot of the underlying data for one of the systems that we use. This is, I think, 250 <laughs> columns at last count. <laughs> Reality is painful <laughs> to look there's at a, anyway. There's a lot to know about your system, and there's a lot that you might want to ask. And we want to make sure that when you've got an opportunity to ask that, we've, got, we've captured that importance dimension. We also talk a lot about high cardinality, because not only are there a lot of columns, but they can have a lot of possible values. So for example, we, looking at the data set that we're going to look at this afternoon, um, we care about customer ID. Each distinct entry might have a different thing from a different customer. We care about things like what query was called on a SQL call and what error came out of it. So these, are a lot of, so these can have a lot of different possible values, and we want to make sure that we're ready for all of this. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that Honeycomb's superpower is the ability to filter and group by any column in your data set. No matter how many columns there are, no matter how many distinct values there are, we're ready to look at them all, and we're ready to share, and we're ready to let you split up and break across all of them. What that leads to is a process that we've started to call the core analysis loop. Let me sort of uh, give you some context here. We're dealing with a data set. We've been triggered by an alert or we've uh, gotten a notification from a user that something feels wrong. And what we want to do is find some way of looking at the data that shows that something's unusual. So for example, we might see that the number of errors has spiked or the duration of our calls has spiked or that the number of processes that are running has dropped, something that allows us to see what looks unusual. Then we want to 
we are going to naturally start formulating hypotheses to figure out what could possibly do it. We'll choose a variable to see whether that explains what's happened. Sometimes that variable is clear, but you know, sometimes we sort of have to guess and stare at the data a little bit and figure out what that is. And then we will break that down. Um, filter. We will either filter it out to see whether once we remove that variable, everything looks OK, or we'll break down by that variable to compare the world with that variable without that variable, trying to see whether we have successfully explained it. So basically, it's like, this looks wrong. Is it this? Is it that? Is it this other thing? And you just do that a bunch of times, right, while you're troubleshooting. And uh, click, and then no, and then click, and click again. And all the while, the world is kind of burning down around you. This, this, is, this is a painful process sometimes. Uh, that certainly can be. So yes, yeah, certainly one way that you can make that a lot simpler is by knowing your data really well by having an intuitive guess. And there certainly are some people I know who can sort of stare at a bump in their data and say, ah, that looks to me like a SQL failure. But for all the rest <laughs> of us, we'd like to, well, find a way that we can help users uh, support that. So we built this tool called BubbleUp. That's meant to help humans recognize the parts that are interesting, to use your skills to see what's going on. We'll turn some of these big questions about how the data sets are different, whether this variable makes a difference or not, over to the computer and let the computer do the computing. And then we'll let you do the looking and the recognizing to figure out what the actually interesting parts are. This method can save a ton of time for analysis. And of course, it makes your customers happy because your system's up faster and your work's up more successfully. Oh, so we do the calculations all in parallel. So you can do what you're good at, which is using your instincts and pattern matching with your eyes. You can go, instead of doing that click, no, click, no, a bunch of times, it all happens at the same time. Yeah, let me, uh, let me show you how this works. We're inside the Honeycomb interface, and I'd like to weave this scenario that I've just gotten an alert on my phone, and it's warned me that there are some users whose queries are timing out. Now, I'm in charge of a system that uh, processes uh, back-end queries for other people. So they're off running their systems, and their customers are asking for things, and that's popping out on our system. Now what's important to me, of course, is guaranteeing, therefore, that when they're calling our API, we're giving them a good quality of service, that their queries are being serviced rapidly. So I might go ahead and go check uh, the sort of uh, standard percentile data for looking at uh, how long queries are taking. So we can see at the top of the screen here, I've looked at the P50 for duration, how long are queries, to, what's the median query taking? And the answer is, you know, it's about 35 milliseconds. Sometimes we get a little bit quicker. But we're looking pretty steady at 35. So the median person is doing just fine right now. P95, the 95th percentile, the 95th percentile person is actually doing pretty well too. We can see that there was sort of like a little bump here, but things are looking okay. Now they're at 300 milliseconds, so you know our 5% lowest are still experiencing like a 300 millisecond experience, but that's been constant. But now look at this bottom here, the P99. That's where oh, I yeah. began to see this substantial bump. Something happened at 10.15 in the morning that raised the 99th percentile time from half a second all the way up to a full second. That's a little scary. Something's gone wrong, and I'd really like to know what it is. Unfortunately, just looking at this table doesn't give me enough richness. So I'm going to go ahead and change these over from looking at the duration queries to looking at a heat map query. Now we, so. In Honeycomb, what I've done is I've gone ahead and I've specified that I want to look the heat map of the duration instead. When this query comes back, what we see is that um, we can see that first one of our initial hypotheses might have been 
gosh, maybe the count got high. I can look at this and go say, well, no, honestly, the number of queries that have come to our system, the amount of events that we're processing, hasn't actually increased all that much. It will increase later. At 11 a.m., there seems to be a big growth. But right now, that's not the problem. And so I use the heat map. A heat map is a wonderful visual innovation, and I want to see more people getting to know heat maps because, frankly, just heat maps are one of those things that make me, as a visualization guy, like sort of bounce happily in my sleep. On the x-axis, we're looking at uh, time. On the y-axis, we're looking at duration, and each cell is colored by the number of people or the number of events that have looked at that cell. So or that have had that cell. So for example, um, we can see that these pale greens at the top mean that there are some people who are experiencing overall like 700 milliseconds, and that sort of ticks all the way across here. We can see on the bottom row that it's getting darker and darker and darker. That's reflecting the count. And what that shows is that even as the traffic has been increasing, most people are still experiencing short times, much less than one-tenth of a second. And we can see this spike coming off here, this group of places where increasing numbers of events were coming in that took between half a second and a full second. Like basically the Loch Ness Monster is there. Pretty much, yeah. Now, the standard thing that we might want to do is start hypothesizing and making some guesses about what's going on. For example, I might say, hey, you know, maybe that's the sign of an Amazon endpoint, or sorry, of an Amazon of availability zone failing. So let's switch over to availability zone and rerun that query and see whether that explains it. And mm -hmm. I look over here and I can see that some of our some of our data is in US East 1 and some of it is in US West 1 and that seems to make no difference whatsoever. Yeah. We can start hypothesizing about other things. We can start digging around and say, ah, maybe it's, maybe it's a particular host. Right, it's a particular machine that's failing us. And again, we can come back here and start jumping through all the different ones. And we can see that each of them is pretty sparse, and none of them is directly responsible yeah. for this spike. They all have Nessie. Right. So this is, this is a pretty painful process, what I've just started doing. Try a variant, see if it works. Try a variant, see if it works. The idea behind Bubble Up is it allows us to pick the data that we think is interesting and see how it's different. So I've now switched over to the Bubble Up tab. I'm selecting this little chunk of data right here, some of the stuff that's experiencing the worst experience. And what Honeycomb's doing is it's looking at those points that I've selected and it's comparing them to all the rest. And it's showing that across every dimension in our data. And, and all you did is just draw the little box, right? I just yeah. drew the little box. Yeah, OK. And so we can see very quickly, for example, the stuff inside this box has a very different user ID than everything, than everything else. The stuff inside the box is dominantly this user 20109, while the baseline you know, almost has a wide variety of users. The stuff inside the box also has this very specific endpoint. It's all talking to API v2 tickets export. And we can see that, and we can see, um, again, it's the same end, it's a different endpoint. We can see that it's all hitting the same error. We can see which service it's coming from. We can also see some things that don't seem to matter, like when we come over here and look at the host name. We can see, as I said before, that, you know, Host name doesn't seem to matter. It's not affecting it. The distributions aren't obviously different. Customer ID doesn't seem to be too importantly different. You know, things like platform, is it coming in on Android or iOS, doesn't seem to matter much either, nor does the availability zone. So that's been great. We now know some places to start looking. For example, we can go ahead and just, you know, go yell at this user. But I'd like to do something more interesting than that and point out that these steps can fit together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab one particular trace that has experienced this. This trace is from the selection. I'm going to filter on it. And I'm going to jump over to traces mode. 
what I can see is that we're now going to process one request that came from API V2 tickets export. That's the thing. And, um, and it's a trace that had taken, you know, just about a second, which was the time range that we're concerned about. And I can jump right into that trace now and go look to see what happened. Why was it slow? We can see the structure that's pretty straightforward about what happens inside a trace and what happens when we're processing one of these API v2 tickets export endpoints. <laughs> that's a lot of calls. Yep, so we call check rate limits, and that seemed to go pretty quickly. And we called fetch user info, and that went pretty quickly. And then we called fetch tickets for export. And check this out. 26 times we did a little MySQL query. <laughs> Every time we did that little MySQL query, we did it serially, one after the next, after the next, after the next. And each of them seemed to take a pretty reasonable amount of time. But wow, it really went all the way out there. That's a little scary. Yeah, somebody really needed to get those tickets, I guess, over and over. So this makes me wonder, is it something about the way that they're making their call to our system? Is it something about the way that we're reflecting on this data and the way that we're uh, – is it something about the way that we're processing those calls? Is it something about the way that they're invoking us? Maybe they're calling our API in a way that we didn't expect. And so I can start also seeing things like, hey, this is an unusual status code. It's status code 25. Um, the scroll bar that I'm going through on the right is giving us additional information about the span. So for example, this particular span has the name query and comes from the service name MySQL. It ran 39 milliseconds. And I can also see, for example, its specific ID and parent ID. And I can also see what the SQL query that invoked it was here. And this query that invoked it was, you know, select star from tickets. I can Pretty grab forward. What's that? Yeah. And the great thing is I can grab that query now, jump back, and let's bring that back into the query builder and go see and actually go see what the distribution of that time looked like. So one of our questions might be, for example, were we calling this in an unusual way during this spike? Were we, was it getting longer or shorter than it usually does? Looking at the heat map, we can see that this query, uh, you know, select star from tickets, is a baseline of our system. We've been calling it constantly. It always runs between 35 and 45 milliseconds. And we have, but we have started calling it more in this period, and that's probably because of this high level of parallelism. So that can tell us, again, it begins to be the next step of our investigation. We can start asking questions about how we learn from that query and you know, why we're calling it in this particular way. Now, some fun things we might do, now that we know something, for example, about the fact that it was a particular endpoint, we could go back and change that breakdown to particularly go look at endpoint shape. And let's go take a look at this data again now. We can flip between different breakdowns on the endpoint shape and see how they look. We can see that the endpoint organizations and macros, and search, and you know, assignable, all these different sort of things that our API can do, didn't change at all. Only this one, tickets export, is the one that has the uh, spike. Yeah, so, that one might be ripe for refactoring. Absolutely. Now, if we'd been really, really lucky up front, we might have guessed endpoint was the thing to filter on. And then we might have been clever enough to have like scrolled through until we found this. But I think it was really nice to be able to go into BubbleUp and find out directly what was the one field whose fault it was and be able to figure out how to move forward from it. Definitely. That's a, that saves, typically saves a lot of time. If you don't know what caused something, why would you even be investigating? Or why, If you knew what caused something, why would you be investigating in the first place? 
Uh, but now exactly. there's a cause messy. Great. Hmm. So with that, I think I'm ready to uh, hop back into our slides. Oh uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No problem. So to recap, just a little. Bubble up looked at every dimension of how the selected area, the thing inside the rectangle, was different from the things outside the rectangle. For each of those dimensions, it grabbed a few thousand points, and it drew these little visualizations of the histogram so that we could see how they were different. It ranked those histograms in order by the amount of difference so that things with a dramatic standout, like the endpoint shape and the user ID, got pushed to the front while things with less dramatic uh, outliers uh, got moved towards the back. For each of these little visualizations, we could slide our mouse over it so that we could actually go look at what percentage of the data it was showing or it wasn't showing. We didn't have a whole lot of it, but there's a number of events in our data set that didn't have all the dimensions defined. And so if they don't, so for example, if some things don't have an availability zone, then we show those with partially filled or unfilled circles to help emphasize that difference. With all these pieces together, you're really able to pretty quickly zoom in and go figure out what the pieces where this uh, fits or doesn't fit, and to identify how an outlier is different or is similar to uh, the data around it. So uh, the team built Bubble Up towards the end of last year, and uh, we shipped it earlier this year, and uh, we've made a bunch of improvements based on feedback from our customer, uh, customers who have gotten a lot of value out of it, um, as these quotes show. Uh, and in particular, I also recommend that you take a look at a case study we did with the game studio BHVR. Uh, they rely a lot on third-party services to deliver their games to customers, uh, especially via the login to different game platforms. Uh, and they really found that the, is, this, is it this provider? Is it this other provider? Is it the network? Is it us? Like they, they found that dance to go a lot faster with Bubble Up. Uh, so check that case study out on our site at honeycomb.io slash case hyphen studies under BHVR. Um, and with that, it's time for us to get to questions. Anybody? Let's see. I'm not seeing any questions. Does anyone? Please do enter your questions. As we're waiting for those, I think it is worth saying that the way that Bubble Up thinks about the world right now, it is based on looking at a heat map. And so right now we've only enabled Bubble Up coming out of the heat map mode because that's the one that allows you to really unambiguously say, these are the points that I care about, these are the points that I'm not as interested in. Yeah, and that drawing that little box is, is pretty mind-blowing. I've, I've watched customers do that for the first time, and their eyes really do seem to just get wider and wider. Uh, but uh, hopefully you'll get to try it out yourself sometime. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing any questions from the audience, so I think perhaps we have answered all questions. Oh, here we are. Who's got one? Um, is Bubble Up good for finding issues only? Uh, what about other kinds of performance optimization? Bubble Up will help you find really any important distinction that sits in your data. So we happen to be looking here at a performance issue. Um, but we can look at, or sorry, we happen to be looking here at like a particular alert. But we could look at a performance issue. We could look at almost anything. Um, you know, one of my colleagues has been using it recently to look at the build process. Each piece of the build process generates like a, uh, generates like a time that it took. And he's able to like go look and say, hey, this horizontal stripe of data that I see across here that's taking five seconds, how is it different from all the others? He can, and it just pops straight out, oh, yes, this is the points that are, I don't know, um, you know, the compiler as opposed to being the points that are the testing system. So we can link it into almost anything. I, I see another question. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. The next question is, uh, how do we model or plan for how much data the Honeycomb agent will send from our production apps to Honeycomb? Now, I, love, I know a little bit about this, but uh, Danielle, go ahead. Uh, how you model or plan the amount of data. Um, you know, we have other experts at the team who know a lot more than that about, who know a lot more than me about that. However, I am happy to say that we've been thinking a lot about ways of helping with sampling. In fact, uh, we just released a report from uh, Liz Fong Jones talking about ways that you can sample and uh, and adaptively sample. One of the nice yeah. things about that is that that really lets you set up your system to describe approximately how much data you want to keep and what you want your overall sample rate to be, and to tell it what the important dimensions that you think are the ones that you want to make absolutely sure you are or aren't sampling on. So for example, you might say, I care a lot about HTTP status code, and I care a lot about, um, say, slow queries versus fast queries. And so you want to make sure that each of those buckets gets well populated. So if there's very few errors, then we will dynamically sample fewer of the, you know, we'll dynamically sample every one of them. While on the other hand, boring HTTP requests that go quickly, we'll only sample, you know, one in a hundred, one in a thousand, one in ten thousand. Yeah. That said, we do know, we do know that timing is a little bit limited. Or sorry, we do know that our facilities for modeling this sort of thing can be challenging. Our solutions engineers have some uh, great tricks up their sleeves and can tell you a lot more about that than I can. Yeah, and those things should definitely be based on your business goals as well. So it's, it's super, super important to start from that perspective and, and build that into your, into your dynamic sampling. Uh, please do ask further questions about this in our Slack. If you're, in, uh, if you're already trying out Honeycomb, there's a lot of, a lot of great, uh, great info there and smart people to help you. have a um, couple more questions. Oh, uh, let's see. One user asks, can you create a heat map view from a trace view today? Um, today, like literally at this moment, you do have to be, um, you do have to look at a trace and then copy the field out. However, we've been making a lot of improvements to tracing and in the next uh, week or two you are going to see a couple of versions to release that allow you to more quickly break down from one view into another as well as some uh, built-in views inside the trace that can help with that. All right. Next question is, can I instrument custom metrics from another source, like a synthetic load test, so that I can correlate those metrics with observability metrics from Honeycomb? We've had a couple users begin to play with instrumenting metrics from other sources um, who are adapting StatsD type uh, outputs. The other thing that you can actually do is while you're collecting your events in Honeycomb, you can put in an extra layer of metadata into those uh, events themselves. So we've uh, had some examples. Uh, so internally, for example, we often are interested in, for example, the number of routines that are running overall in a machine on the amount of memory that's running because that can be something that explains what's going on with the failure. So we've so uh, when we send an event for some of our high volume services, we'll throw into it amount of free memory on the service, number of, simul number of processes that are running simultaneously. Ultimately, you can just take those additional events and feed them in through something like either the Honeytail log reading system and bring them in as another data source. All right, it looks like we've got one more question here. That's a good question to wrap on, I feel like, unless we can see some more. Uh, what's next for Bubble Up from a roadmap perspective? Coming up ahead on Bubble Up, in the short term, is that we're planning to, well, the most recent changes were beginning to make it more ready for trace data by being able to uh, properly show things like giving that percentage of events that participate and hiding the nulls. And that was a pretty big change. Uh, we've made a couple of small mathematical changes in the back end, in the back end recently. Uh, for example, we got better at the way that we subtract events from each other, which um, has made for much crisper and cleaner distributions. Coming up next is broadening the idea of bubble up to any selection against any filter. So what we'd really like to be able to do is get to the point where when you have one filter that you think is interesting, status equals 500, or, you know, uh, I don't know, 
memory is greater than 200, or any, if you can write it as a filter inside the system, we'd like to allow you to bubble up and go see what other dimensions are correlated with that one, and to understand how those dimensions fit. Overall, all of these fit very well into our broader story of helping users move away from having to do the breakdown dance of breaking down dimension after dimension to go see what's interesting, and go have the system suggest those differences and help figure out where to look first. All right. Uh, I think we're through all the questions. Um, uh, thank you for joining us today, everyone. Uh, I'd like to remind you uh, that we're, um, we're hoping to get your feedback from the Feedback tab. And uh, also, uh, I'd like to let you know that you're going to be getting a follow-up email to, to let you know when this webinar is available for on-demand viewing, and that will include a copy of the slides. So the links here and in other parts of this presentation will be clickable. Um, and with that, stay tuned for our next and final installment uh, about collaboration and curation. Hey, I'm going to pass it real quick. Oh, go right ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, since I see that like on this How to Get Started slide, we remind people about Honeycomb Play. Oh um, yeah. Honeycomb Play is real is real data that we captured from a past incident that we've brought into Honeycomb system. It guides you through a, set of, a series of queries and a discovery process. And it actually has a little bit of a breakdown dance, and it does hit a, hit a heat map. Now, that wasn't designed for BubbleUp. It was built before BubbleUp happened. But I'm going to encourage you, if you want to learn more about BubbleUp, to just drop straight into play, or go look at our RubyGems interactive data set, or one of the other sets that's available online. And without even having to bring in your own data, you can be bubbling up literally today, you know, heck, right now, <laughs> because it's, it's there and it's fun to play with. Well, there's a, the, the sound of a, a true convert. I mean, a, you know, designer has got to be a convert. <laughs> Thank you again. Yes, please do go through, check out our eGuides, go try out with real data in Honeycomb Play, and hopefully we'll see you in our chat uh, asking and answering questions. Thanks, everybody.